All right, unit three, amino acids. This might be one of the most important units of biochemistry one, for sure, because this is going to lay the foundation for um, the, the next several units, the next three units at least, as well as a lot of biochemistry two material. So if you're going to pick one unit to do really well in, make sure it's this unit, very important. Um, quickly be familiar that proteins do everything in the body. They're the exciting things. Um, we're going to talk more about the specifics of what they do over units four, five, and six. So for now, just be familiar that um, proteins are very important for many diverse functions and structural roles in the body. So there are 20 amino acids. They all generally look the same. Make sure you know them as sweater ionic. They're sweater ions meaning they have both positive and a negative charge. This is at physiological conditions, so at a pH of about 7. That's what this is talking about. So even, remember, even if it has a positive and a negative charge, it's still a charged molecule. It might have a net charge of 0, but it's still a charged molecule. That comes up on many test questions. If you see an amino acid or if you see a protein, it's always going to be charged. Net charge, that's a different story. We'll talk about that later. Glycine is one of its favorites because it has an exception. It is a symmetric amino acid. It's the smallest amino acid. So anytime you see glycine, which we'll see it a couple times in the next few slides, make sure to make note about glycine's characteristics. Amino acids are characterized by their R group. We'll talk about R groups in a second. So we talked about PKAs in the last unit. All amino acids have these first two. They have a PKA around 2, 2.1, a PKA around 9.6. A few of them have a PKA uh, between 3 and 13. We're going to talk about what those are. Preview, it's going to be your basic, your acidic, and then there's a few exceptions, uh, cysteine and tyrosine. We'll, we'll see those in a minute as well here. So know the definition of the isoelectric point, abbreviated PI. It's the point where the pH, where the net charge of the amino acid or protein is zero. They are also least soluble when they're at their PI. So you can kind of think of PI as the average of the PKAs it has. If that doesn't make sense now, don't worry about it. This will go into more detail now. This is just an overview of the rest of the unit. So this is what your first order of business should be, knowing the five families on the side here, and making sure you can name off all the amino acids. Make sure you can name them and know their abbreviation. Don't get things confused like asparagine and aspartate, glutamine and glutamate. Those are some of the most common ones that people will mix up. Also note that tyrosine is in, technically could be in two categories. Tyrosine has an aromatic group plus an OH. So it's it's both classified as aromatic and polar. Phenylalanine and tryptophan down here are big aromatics, and because they're aromatics and they don't have a polar group, they're also um, a little bit in the nonpolar group. So some books will just have these first four families in the tyrosine and these will be uh, distributed to the other groups. But as far as we're concerned, know all five of the groups and just know the features of the other ones. So let's look at the amino acids in a minute here. All of them basically look like this. There's one central carbon. There's a carboxyl group, an amino group, a hydrogen 
and that's the same for all of them. The only thing that makes them different is this R group here. The R group is what puts them into different families. They're stereoisomers, not that important. It's more organic chemistry. Don't worry too much about any of these Greek letters in the numbering system. I've never seen that come up before. So no, you do not have to memorize the structure of all these, but yes, you should be familiar with special features of it. For example, the, uh, the R group in glycine is another hydrogen. Hydrogen being the smallest element, therefore glycine is going to be the smallest amino acid. Also asymmetrical because you have those, or symmetrical because you have those two hydrogens, excuse me. Alanine just has a methyl group, so that's the second smallest. Proline's a weird one, um, one of the exceptions. It's not an, an amino acid, it's an amino acid. You have valine and leucine. Going up in size, you have isoleucine, methionine, tryptophan, and phenylalanine. These are not perfectly in size. You have one of those uh, in a chart later in the unit um, that I'll point out to you that are exactly in size order. The things to note about this one are tryptophan has this double aromatic ring here. Phenylalanine has a six-membered ring here, a single one. Methionine is one of the two amino acids that has a sulfur in it. Now that we're looking at the polar uncharged amino acids, the other one that has a sulfur in it is cysteine. Cysteine is another favorite. We'll talk about that in a little bit here. Serine and threonine have OH groups. Asparagine and glutamine both have this amide group, I believe, the carbonyl with the NH2. And tyrosine, like I said before, has the aromatic group with an OH attached to it. So it has both aromatic here and polarity here. For the basic amino acids, they have an extra amino group. So the extra amino group here. Arginine is very nitrogen dense. So it has a couple extra amino groups attached on. So you might get a question like, what is the highest proportion of nitrogen? Think arginine on that one. Um, depending on what the answers are, arginine or possibly histidine, because if you're looking at histidine, it also has it's a smaller molecule and it's pretty nitrogen dense. The main thing to know about histidine is it has a cyclic structure as well. Those are your three basic amino acids. Aspartate and glutamate very similar to asparagine and glutamine, except they have an extra carboxylic acid group here. So those are your two acidic amino acids. Talking about the exceptions, proline, we mentioned it's an amino acid because it has a secondary amine. That's what make, gives it the cyclic structure. So no proline is the exception for that one. Cysteine, the R groups, remember its R group was, at the end of it was an SH. That's going to form disulfide bonds. Make sure you know that it's very important in stabilizing the proteins in nature. This is the oxidation and reduction of the cysteine SH group. As you're oxidizing it, you don't need to just be, you can add oxygen or you can subtract hydrogen and electrons. The definition of that is on this next slide. So the 
three ways of oxidation. You can lose electrons, remove hydrogen, or you can add oxygen. So if you're talking about reduction, reduction would just be gaining electrons, gaining hydrogen, or subtracting oxygen. It could be any combination. It just needs to meet one of those criteria, one of these three criteria, in order for it to be a oxidation reaction. This will commonly be abbreviated as redox, oxidation reduction reaction, if it make, meets any of these characteristics. Be familiar with these two. These are your non-protein amino acids. All right, so in its natural form for most proteins, um, not the acidic and basic ones, in the human body, physiological conditions are on a pH of seven. This is what you have here, this middle state. This is you have your R group, hydrogen, carboxylic acid group without a hydrogen, and the amino acid group with an extra hydrogen, giving it a positive charge. So the net charge is zero. Make sure you under, understand this concept really well. We're going to look at a few actual examples of amino acids with R groups. This is another chart illustrating that form. So. As we go this way, we're deprotonating protonating, taking away the proton or the hydrogen, and that is what's giving it a negative charge. So we took away this hydrogen right here, one of those, so this became neutral, the amino group, this remained negative, so as we went more basic, we got a negative charge and deprotonated. So if we go more acidic, and there are more hydrogens around because acidity is abundance of hydrogens we're going to add a hydrogen here so it's going to take away the negative charge to the carboxylic acid group and give it a plus one charge so it's the generic form here's an actual example with glycine so as you can see, the net charge in its middle form here is zero. As you become more basic, going this way, you're going to have a negative one charge. As you go more acidic, you're going to have a positive one charge. So the pKa, the neutral point here, um, so if we're looking at these two forms, the point where you have about 50% this neutral form and 50% this negative one form is at a pKa of about 9.6. That's this number right here. That's the buffer region for the second um, group of glycine. This number right here is about 2.34 where you have 50% of the plus one form right here and 50% of this middle neutral form. The average of those two is the isoelectric point, the PI here. This is how you do the math on that one. So with, when you have a third pKa group, uh, it's called pKr, because it's standing for the pKa of the R group. So the pKr is about 4.25. That means 
an acidic amino acid like glutamate at normal pH is going to be negative one. Acidic is going to be this negative one form. So as you make it more acidic, take it into a more acidic environment, it's going to become neutral and could even go positive one if you go beyond the, the 2.19, the PK1 group. I'm sorry, the PK1 um, number here for that last group here, this part of the carboxylic acid. I know this part's confusing, but just stick with it. So, let's take a look at this one more time. So let's see, this is the normal um, form right here, the normal amino acid structure where you have a negative charge on the carboxylic acid group and a positive charge on the amino. And the R group is protonated if it's below, if the pH is below 4.25. So at a neutral pH, physiological pH of about 7, the R group is going to be deprotonated, giving a negative 1 charge. So if you continue to go more basic with it, that's when you're going to deprotonate the amino group. And if you're starting from your, your neutral position here, as you go a little more acidic, first the R group is going to protonate. Second, the carboxylic acid group of the basic amino acid structure is going to protonate. So that, that's why this number, this PK1, is for the, the first group that we're talking about deprotonating here. The PKR is talking about the R group either protonating or not protonating. That's a mess, so I'll just explain that in class if you're not getting it at this point. Histidine does a very similar thing. Histidine is basic. It's a weird one. Um, even though it's basic, it still has a PKR of below 7. The other two basic amino acids are not that way. We'll take a look at those numbers again in a minute here. All right, these are the charts that I was talking about where it will be in order of how big they are. So just know really what's in red here. So know that your two smallest ones, your two biggest ones, I would know your PKR of tyrosine is around 10. Know the uh, highest PIs and the lowest PIs. Imagine that the lowest PIs, the most acidic, are with the acidic amino acids. Move that out of the way. And the basic ones are arginine and lysine. Also note that cysteine has a PKR. So cysteine and tyrosine were the two um, non-acidic or non-basic amino acids that have a PKR, so make sure you know that. And know that the basic and amino acids are the other five total with dissociable R groups. So next slide we're talking about the hydropathy index here. Positive means it's hydrophobic, negative means it's hydrophilic or water loving. So water fearing are mostly your hydrophobic um, non-polar amino acids. So I don't think you need to know the whole list, but definitely probably be familiar with the top two. Know that if it is uh, nonpolar, it's going to be more hydrophobic. As far as your hydrophilic, you have your basic amino acids plus your acidic amino acids and then two polar ones. The two polar ones are very similar or identical in number to the 
acidic amino acids. It's because they are very similar in structure. Cysteine has a very high index, but we don't really talk about it that much because it does the disulfide bondings. Here's an example of SH being able to form hydrogen bonds. I would know that you know pepsin is going to be at a very low pH. This PI is correlated with pH. And so lysozyme is a favorite example to use for something that would be at a very high or basic pH. Amino acids are held together by peptide bonds. I'm going to go through this quickly because it summarizes it on this slide. Just memorize everything on this slide. Very, very important, comes up all the time. Characteristics of peptide bonds on slide 40. I've seen that before. Know that insulin was the first protein sequenced. Maybe on a quiz question you might know that it has three disulfide bonds on there. Proteins can have prosthetic groups. This will make much more sense later on. Prosthetic groups are just an extra non-amino acid thing added to a protein. So it can be a metal like iron in your hemoglobin in your blood. You can have phosphates, sugars, fats, other metals. It's just stuff that is not amino acids in a protein. So this kind of further explains prosthetic groups, but you don't really need to know this until later on in biochemistry. So it's kind of overview material now. Don't get too caught up in it. Don't worry about, don't worry about this one for now. So again, I'm going to skip through a bunch of slides here because it's all nicely summarized on slides 58 and 59. So this 58 and 59 really tells the story of how to sequence and identify amino acids, the amino acids in proteins. So make sure you would know like DDT, DDT as this name plus Cleland's reagent, iota acetate as IA. So for example, be be able to tell the whole story. DDT reduces the disulfide bonds. Iota acetate stabilizes the cysteine residues so those bonds that were broken by DDT can't reform. This is one of the few examples of a strong carboxylic acid. is trifluoroacetic acid. So we'll talk about this in SI, but make sure you really understand slides 58 and 59 for how it works and what all these reagents are used for and what amino acids they can break. Um, one last point on this are his favorite four right here that he mentions. These are on slide 55. So cyanogen, bromide, breaks methionine, trypsin, breaks your bases, except histidine, isn't listed. Staphylococcal protease is also called V8 protease. That does your acidic amino acids. And chymotrypsin does your aromatics plus leucine and methionine. So definitely know these, these four here and exactly what amino acids they break. So I know that's a lot in this unit. Um, really start with the amino acids and make sure you can, you're not going to be asked how to sequence this or do this. This is very confusing, uh, very advanced. You have to do a little bit of it in lab. But as far as the test goes, don't worry about it, but you must know these two last slides, or two of the, the last three slides, 58 and 59 and just know DNA sequences are coding for proteins or coding for amino acids which make proteins. That's all we got for unit three.